Everything looks good now. Hi, everybody. Kent Martz here from Explore Scientific for Wednesday's episode of First Light Chronicles. I have with me today Scott Roberts, the founder and president of Explore Scientific. Scott, are you there? There he is. I'm here. I'm here. So, Still wobbly so we, after the 99th Global Star Party, but yeah, that was a good. We, uh, we, go ahead. We, we just had a false start, it looks like, on getting going and realized that we weren't getting any chats and that was a clue we weren't streaming so uh <laughs> scott you were up with the global yep a uh, windows defender apparently booted us for some reason uh paul says but uh scott mm -hmm. you were up uh with the global star party last night got done before yeah. midnight uh so that was the 99th one you had a good time uh yeah. and had a great lineup but man I i'm on the email list of everybody the invitation list scott sends out answer responses scott you got a big lineup coming for next week which is the 100th show what's yeah, going on everybody there? all these speakers want to be on the 100th program which is great uh many of them have done you know i i don't even know how many shows david levy has done i every one of them except for one uh and i don't even really count that one so much uh except that um uh, this was a uh, international observe the moon night uh, event that was done by night sky network and um, it was uh, you know I I believe an oversight uh, from uh, the some from the person doing the schedule either they didn't get the message that David Levy would do it or something happened but uh, he wasn't invited <laughs> so, and I wasn't the guy doing the schedule so Anyways, but uh, we love David. Uh, David's like one of my best friends in the whole, whole wide world. And um, uh, and he has done a phenomenal job all the way through. Uh, he is, uh, and, and, you know, so people get to see him on our programs every week. Uh, but uh, also uh, with the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party, there it is, poster back there. Uh, you're actually going to be able to observe with him and meet with him and maybe get a book signed by him if you'd like. Um, so, um, but uh, yeah, the 99th Global Star Party was, uh, went kind of long. It was, uh, it went till about 11 o'clock at night almost and um, uh, had all the speakers were there except for the very last one was uh, Bob Fugate and he had some family issue he had to deal with. So um, that uh, Adrian Bradley filled in for him and showed some of his beautiful nightscape work and, and that kind of thing. So it was good. All good. So next week is the 100th, and there's a lot of some potential. 100 is a significant number for us. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, so 100 global star parties. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, programs that have been uh, on YouTube and, you know, social media um, that have uh, also shared astronomy, live astronomy, that kind of thing. I think that we're, if, if we're not the the most, uh, uh, you know, prevalent one, we're, we're one of. Um, uh, so that's, uh, um, you know, to do a hundred of these things, there is so many, I mean, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of hours, maybe, maybe over a thousand hours of great information uh, from speakers like uh, Gary Palmer, Molly Wakeling, uh, Jason Gonzel, uh, uh, Chuck Ayub has been on the program. Uh, we've had JPL scientists on the program. Next week, we will have uh, the uh, principal astronomer from the SETI uh, Institute. Uh, that's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence in uh, Institute. And uh, uh, I think it's going to be great. He is a fantastic speaker. 
Uh, his name is Seth Shostak. And uh, so that's just one of the people that's going to be on. But you're going to see a lot of familiar faces uh, coming on next Tuesday. So are we giving away any prizes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is the hundredth anniversary, not the hundredth anniversary, the hundredth event. Um, I keep calling it the hundredth anniversary. Uh, uh, we have the IXOS 100 mount, so we will be giving away an IXOS 100. Uh, we have hundred degree eyepieces, so you can expect a couple of those in there. Um, so we will make it special. You know. Uh the, uh, for those of you who don't know, the IXOS 100 is a go-to tracker mount. Great right. for uh, if you have a DSLR and a camera lens, you yeah. can get into uh, some tracking so you're doing longer exposures. Uh, and if you've got like an ED-80 or something like that, uh, right in the wheelhouse uh, for uh, really getting into astrophotography and learning the ropes. It's also, Scott, as you well know, very powerful because you can wire it to a computer and do some incredibly high-end work with yeah. amount that retails for five hundred and ninety-nine dollars. Uh, right. You know, it's just a fabulous tool, and you know, more and more of them are out there, and we're seeing just some astounding pictures that people oh, are yeah. not using. Yeah, Wade uh, Prunty, who follows this program, did a hundred-hour exposure. Uh, you know, of course, stacking and tracking, but still really put that thing through its paces, you know, with a, a lot of equipment mounted on it. Right. You know, we rate it at nine pounds for astrophotography gear and camera and all that stuff and 15 or 16 pounds for visual. But uh, people oftentimes don't really take our limb seriously. And uh, mm -hmm. JR uh, lives down in Louisiana. He uh, uh, is running a 180 millimeter Maxitov Cassegrain uh, and camera gear on the Exos 100, uh, running with 24 pounds of gear on his telescope, wow. and and has added extra counterweights. Get 18 pounds of counterweights. Uh, oh man! Doing planetary, doing planetary. And he's doing astrophotography with that rig. Planetary, doing planetary astrophotography, uh, working in the 5400 millimeter focal length range with yeah. an with an IXOS 100. Yeah, so it is, you know. A powerful little device that we have out there. So Pekka wanted to know if this is live. Hi, Pekka. How are you? Yes, it's live. It's. I guess I, I, Scott. I think we're running into because we've been doing some recorded broadcasts that were live. Yeah, we have some. We, we are broadcasting. It still it says live because we're streaming it live. Uh, but uh, uh, we have uh, pre-recorded stuff that's out there too you know just to so for the people that have missed a bunch of the other programming we've done yeah it's pre-recorded live and so it says live like this broadcast we'll run this broadcast in the future and up there it says live but mm -hmm. but we have a little bug that says pre-recorded on top yeah, of previously it. recorded i usually previously, stick that yeah. up there yeah yeah so but i think if you see that, missing that then definitely that's not live right so it's not live live that. where Pekka can wave to us, you know, like he is right now. Right. So <laughs> exactly. All right. So um, that's coming up. Uh, you know, this is first light chronicles. You know, we have a first light series of telescopes, which gave its name to this broadcast and mm -hmm. it's sort of become, how do you get into astronomy and things like that? And, you know, James Webb space telescope had first light yesterday, really on Monday, a little bit, but really strongly on Tuesday. And, um, you know, it is a real popularizer and, and draws people to the idea of astronomy and astrophotography. I can do that. Scott, what's your advice for amateur astronomers out there who can capitalize on this moment of people being interested in it? And like tonight's the super moon, it's a perigee moon. So it's yeah. going to be what, 13 or 14 percent closer and 30 percent brighter. People have been mm -hmm. asking me about it. What's your advice on how we can go about capturing this moment, this singular period of time to, to get people into the hobby we all love? Well, I mean, it's all about communication. First off, you know, so, you know, these live programs is, is a good start. But a good step beyond that uh, is the tried and true uh, join your astronomy club, you know, um, and get involved with them. There are astronomy clubs across the country. 
Uh, we are strongly tied to the Astronomical League and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, and those two organizations represent, at least in North America, uh, and also uh, with memberships around the world, uh, a very, very strong, um, you know, uh, uh, alliance. Um, they have the league itself, I think, has 300 clubs, over 300 clubs, over 20,000 members. Uh, the Royal the RASC in Canada has uh, several thousand members as well. They're older than the uh, Astronomical League is, but these are these are both organizations that have been around for a while. Um, uh, I think the Astronomical League this year is celebrating their 75th anniversary, and I think that the RASC has been around for over 100 years, maybe like 150 years, something like that. Um, uh, but uh, being involved with an astronomy club is great. What if you can't be involved with an astronomy club, okay? Well, there's nothing to stop you from starting kind of an ad hoc astronomy gathering. Uh, and I, I did that um, a long time ago. And um, uh, literally, it was uh, me going out to a street corner. Uh, and uh, pretty soon, there would be like somebody would kind of hang out with me. And it was just two of us. And then it became four of us. And then it became... 20 of us and then it became 50 of us and then we had to go find another place to go observe from uh which we did and then eventually that that group of friends observing friends became like 600 okay uh we i was working at uh, a camera shop called oceanside photographic center at the time uh we sold more and more telescopes and the community got so involved uh that we changed the name of the store to be called Oceanside Photo and Telescope, uh, they now go by the, you know, their initials, OPT, uh, which uh, you might might have also shot from them. But uh, uh, but it's really simple uh, in getting involved. You did it yourself, Kent. Uh, how did you get started? I mean, you, you had, you had a, a father that was kind of uh, very interested, right? Right. Dad um, would take us out, you know, and, and binoculars or just go out and, and watch meteor showers. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, growing up in the 60s, hang on, I got an earbud falling out. Growing up in the 60s, um, now this one wants to fall out. That was weird. Uh -huh. So gr grow up in the 60s, uh, you know, on the north side of a town that had a couple thousand people in it, uh, down in the Arkansas River Valley, the skies were spectacular. And I can you know, I don't remember them being like they are, but I think that that memory fades. But I can remember comments ben, Bennett and West in the late '60s and early '70s. That's cool. Just stretching, you know, big not a, a you know a great comet, you know, a big, bright, obvious uh, nucleus and a big long tail that stretches across the sky. I mean, you know, yeah. the comet Pan-STARRS that's out there. You know, it's it's hard to see it in a telescope. You know, especially right now because of the moonlight. But it's not a big obvious thing. People look up and go, oh, my gosh, there's a comet. Well, with those, people look up and say, oh, my gosh, there's a comet. We haven't had one of those in a long time. But, you know, we would do some try to do some photography on lunar eclipses and things like that. And just, you know, go out and hang out, which I really advocate is a great way to get a kid involved uh, in mm -hmm. astronomy. And, you know, it may be they go on with life and don't have that interest. But we see this really typically, Scott people get in their 40s, 30s, 40s, and start getting that hankering for astronomy again and, and get back into it. We see that pattern all yeah. the time. Well, that's you know, what Galileo but, did. He got started in astronomy when he turned 45. So, you know, so, uh, and he had a nice run at it, but <laughs> which still affects yeah. us today. I wonder, I really wonder what was Galileo's childhood like that got him started interested in stargazing i can imagine he was out you know in florence or wherever he was and seeing incredible skies back then i mean no light pollution to speak of right uh, none zero light pollution they there i don't i mean how how much light pollution can you have from with candles <laughs> yeah uh, none you know you might have the, how much? When the industrial revolution gets going you start having some air pollution that would have affected yeah. them but you still oh, yeah. have inky black nights. I think his childhood was one of curiosity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's an innate curiosity and a wonder people have. And, you know, if you're curious about things, 
I mean, he had to be curious about the telescope because he was like, wow. And, and he thought, well, I wonder what the sky looks like with this. And he looked at Jupiter and went, wow, look at that. You know, uh, he just, you know, he, he looked at the sun and observed sunspots. And, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it, it's just, I think it's just being curious. And Scott, we saw this on Friday, had a couple come in the store and, uh, uh, the, the wife was wanting to buy a telescope and mount for her husband for their wedding anniversary. And we were talking to them and they, you know, they're, they're not rushing to buy something and they live up in a fairly dark part of Southwest Missouri, live an hour and a half away. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you and I were going and, and a group of us were going to a place in Bentonville, a, uh, a bicycler bar, uh, and restaurant to do uh, outreach. And I told them about a good barbecue restaurant in Bentonville and where we're going. So come by and they show up. It's like, you saw this happen. She looks in, in a telescope at the sun and he looks at it and she stands up and she's like in awe. And then yeah, when yeah. It's a little bit darker, we put a 16 inch telescope on the moon and I wasn't over there with you, but Scott, you told me she took over the telescope and started showing. She took over the telescope. I, I, we showed her how to use, you know, focus it, move the telescope, and all the rest of it. We just showed her once, and then she's like off and running, and uh, and then she's sitting back with her husband. The husband was supposed to be the guy that was really into it and very interested. I mean, they drove down from another state to be there for this. Okay. Um, <laughs> and she and this this older guy comes up and he, she can see that he doesn't know really how to look into the telescope. And she goes up and shows him how to focus it, how to center up the moon, how to do all this stuff. And I mean, she owned it at that point, you know, so she was all was in. Cool. She was all in. Yeah. <laughs> she was all she in. Was so all she in. went over what I call the tipping point really fast, you know, so that yeah. night she I, was, she was born, reborn as an astronomer. <laughs> Yeah, I, absolutely. She was, you know, and I was talking some technical stuff, how the mounts work and the go-to works and things. Mm -hmm. And she was like, mm -hmm. but, but when she saw the sun, it saw sunspot, she was full of questions. Yeah, that blew her away. And then when she saw the moon through a 16-inch Newtonian or Dobsonian telescope, I, she was hooked deep. And she, I think she's hooked. She, she actually messaged Saturday and said, hmm. You were talking about that star party in Arizona. When is it? Because we're going. And so, you know, just like, and it wasn't him. It wasn't Eric doing all this. It was Stephanie. Yeah, Eric was, was kind of quiet the place. entire time. The, his wife was really, uh, that was great. That was great. Yeah, it was. Becca, it was. Becca is uh, mentioning about his first experience. I'll read it to you. He says, my dad was also very interested in astronomy. And if he hadn't bought those first binoculars for me, 47 years ago. I don't know what would uh, uh, what I would observe with, but astronomers, uh, but an astronomer would I be what so for? I, yeah, he's saying for, you know, for, for now on, you know, basically that's when he became an astronomer, and he, he thinks it's in he thinks it's in the DNA. Um, and then Pekka wants you to know, know when he can send his congratulation video for the hundredth. Send it in today if you can. That's great. Yeah, not, Peck has been on multiple times as well. So, you know, uh, for yes, sure. He has. Oh, and we were talking, but we were talking about OPT. They're an authorized explorer scientific dealer. There you go. A little plug for them. Oh, so yeah. uh, support the dealers. Well, the first support ones, the actually. Yeah. So Scott, you know, back to, uh, go to the first light. You know, the James West Space Telescope. Yeah. You know, one thing you know I think is important to discuss <clears> is why it's so much better and how you know because all the talk well it, it's an infrared <coughs> telescope and well why does that work and paul pull up that graphic if you would please which one the the NASA. sophie the infrared from sophie so there it is there we go, we go. and scott disappeared nice uh, Scott's okay. magic. He made himself disappear. Okay. So what you're looking at is obviously a constellation of Orion uh -huh. in the visible light. And then you're seeing it in infrared. And so why is infrared better than visible light? Well, down below that, you can see a spectrum 
with high energy gamma rays on the left and then it moves to x-rays and uv and then it shows you the visible wavelength in the 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 spectrum of the rainbow and then on the red side of the rainbow it goes into the infrared and then it goes into um radio waves okay so if you start it turns out that most interstellar dust is about the diameter of the wavelength of light which means the light runs into all that dust and scatters so visible light becomes opaque or just totally dissipates when it runs into clouds of interstellar dust the long wavelengths of that infrared light it go right through that inf go right through it it doesn't care it just passes right through so when we start looking at the sky infrared we're seeing things in wavelengths that our eyes can't see but the cameras can capture and mm -hmm. you know the james west space telescope has a very large aperture extremely sensitive you know very small pixels giving it some really really high definition and that has allowed uh, us to see what was literally invisible to us before and it brings the visible the invisible visible you know i read somewhere and i've thought of this if we could see the night sky night sky in infrared it would be an astounding thing to see because around Orion, there's so much infrared and far red glowing. I mean, it'd just be spectacular. But that's why the infrared is important. And that's why we can see through these interstellar dust clouds uh, because those long wavelengths just go right through it. And so uh, let's go on to some of those images. We've all seen them. Um, but, Paul, you want to pull one up? There we go. Is this uh, Stefan's Quintet? Paul? Uh, I'm yes. Yes, it is. Technical yes, it is. stuff on my end. Yes, it is. So I, I wish I'd had time to get the Hubble images scaled uh, and put beside them, but they're out there. Uh, you know, I found one on, I'll give a plug for it, NBC News, where they have some JavaScript sliders so you can slide back and forth. The differences are astounding. It's like going from, uh, for those of you old enough to remember, it's like going from a, a 110 camera to a 6x6 six six camera. I mean, 110 was the size of your pinky fingernail, you know, if you remember that film camera. And going to a large format camera, the differences are truly astounding. The sharpness, the detail, and what you can see, but that deep field. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one. comparison that they were showing the Hubble Space Telescope uh, comparison yesterday on Global Star Party. Uh, no, I'll just say there was no comparison. You could see the same uh, outlying shapes and stuff like that, but not to this detail. This looks like, uh, gosh, uh, it looks like an ocean wave with incredibly sharp uh, ripples and stuff. And there's this is a region of star birth. Uh, all these tiny little knots that you see here have embryonic stars in them. Uh, planetary formation is happening. There are disks of rotating dust around stars. Uh, it's it's absolutely spectacular. Yeah, it's, it's just, I, I wish I would have had time to get the comparison images together. I just didn't, but yeah. it's, it's like night and it's like, it's like you had Vaseline smeared on your camera lens, and Scott, I know you did that uh, to shoot por for portfolio uh, uh, portrait photos to try and soften things a little bit. I yeah, certainly check this did out. that. So I downloaded the full res version. Okay, yeah, yeah I want to see that of the Hubble Deep Field or the James yeah. West first Deep Field. Here we go. Too. So here we go. Got to merge. So see how far I went in. Oh yeah. yeah. For Can a you go JPEG. More? Yeah, it's actually it's a PNG, but I mean, we're in. That's pretty deep. Yeah. So let's go to that Hubble Deep Field and talk about it for a minute. Which one is that exactly? The one with the big square one with all the stars in it, the arcs and stuff. Oh, oh, oh 
I'm gonna have. I didn't get to pull time to pull that one down yet. So okay, let me so, get to it on the web browser. What, one one thing that I that that we hasn't seen a whole lot of press and people haven't been talking about on Facebook before the press conference uh, on President Biden's press conference, I predicted on Facebook that the specter <clears throat> of the star of the exoplanet that they took was going to show presence of uh, hydrogen, oxygen, water, and carbon. Well, they didn't have any carbon, but it showed a very, very strong spectral line for water. And the importance of that, the implications are immense because where there's water, there's probably life. And, you know, the I know that they picked the best candidate for it. It's a, a it's a big Jupiter. It's in the Goldilocks zone. It's not super hot, so they picked one that they knew probably was going to have a strong signature of water because of where it was. But mm -hmm. it is awesome that they the first one, the first Spectre they got, at least the first Spectre they almost released, got it has water in it because that is super significant to the potential for being some version of life out there. You know, if you start extrapolating it to, you know, we, there were, there were billions of galaxies. Now there's trillions of billions of galaxies because this, uh, deep field image that Paul's going to bring up as we all probably have heard is an area of the sky. That's the size of a grain of sand at arm's length. And every dot that doesn't have spikes on it, is a galaxy and it's just truly astounding when you zoom into this thing all those little arcs are are lens galaxies from that large galaxy cluster right in the center yeah it's incredible you know and and so it's it's lensing give me just a second and i'll have an even bigger yeah. image uh, yeah. almost stars every dot in there is a galaxy i mean it's yeah. every if it doesn't have a spike from what I read, if it, exactly, it's a star. It's a galaxy. It's a galaxy. Now remember, get ready. Remember, that's that's a sky the size of a grain, angular size of a grain of sand, at, uh -huh. at three feet from you. And imagine that all over the sky. You know how many grains of sand will it take to cover the sky? And it's all there. It's just everything with a spike is a star that's in the Milky Way. Everything without a spike is a galaxy. So that's the lensing galaxy right there in the very middle. It's a, I think there's like five of galaxy cluster, like five, three or four Look at that. galaxies. Yeah. A Look spiral at that galaxy on. right there. Yeah. That's obviously pretty close. But look at over the yeah. left. Those and that, are, that other one galaxy galaxies. could be hundreds of billions of stars or a trillion stars. Yeah. Probably every star has, or most of the stars have planets. And that's just one. Look at that. I mean, look how far deep, how deeply you can see in this. It's crazy. Yeah, look, and this is, and Scott, this is only 12 and a half hours of, of time. The yeah. longer they stare at this spot. Yeah, the if they did the 100 hour Wade Prunty special. And yeah, I mean, even it would if be, they do, the Hubble, the first Hubble deep field was t was 12, 11 and a, 11 wow. and a half days. What's going on there? Days? Where? What are you looking at? See the blob? Put your cursor on it. I, Which I, blob? The cursor doesn't. There's my many. Cursor. No, it You're looks talking like about that a... kind of orange looking stretched out thing over one of the. Yeah. Yeah, that is a, that is a gravitationally lensed galaxy. Isn't that cool? So, it is so very what that cool. means is, Paul. There's a background galaxy that's vastly yes. farther away, 13 or 14 billion light years away, that's being a very early galaxy formed in, after the Big Bang that's being gravitationally lensed and bent and magnified by this uh, big star cluster in the very center of this image. And so it allows us to see much, much farther in the past than we would otherwise and we've been looking at lens galaxies for a long time. And they's, there's actually people who go through and analyze them and then put them back together and assemble a picture of what the galaxy looks like. And so I'm sure there's people working on this right now. 
like right there, that big smear that yeah. goes off counter, you know, like a circle going. I up wonder the if that's the telescope. No, it can't no. be, can it? No, because no, there's that... other things that aren't smeared. Right. That's the light being pushed Bent. around, pushed and pulled. Bent, Grav gravitationally linked yeah. by that. By yeah. gravity. Yeah, it's crazy. By gravity, by the massive gravity. Look at which, all those galaxies, man. Which Einstein predicted. One, two, predicted. three, four, yeah. five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, just, ten, just in the field 11. right here. You can just go on and on and on. Yeah, and oh, let me show you how much little... I've zoomed in. Okay, let me put it right back in the middle. How about yeah, that? Just start zooming in now. Just start zooming in now again. I can only take it so far with this software. Yeah, but go as far as you can. That's it. So every single white dot you see There's tons. is a galaxy. Is a galaxy. And there's there's astounding number of little faint white dots in here that just blow my mind how much which i'm so, not surprised so there let's just say we have a telescope that can do four times this into space and we see this galaxy and on that galaxy there's a little planet and on that little planet there's a bunch of people it wouldn't matter anyway because that was how many billions of years ago uh, this goes back to more than 13 billion years. Yeah. So if you matter. wave now. <laughs> <laughs> because if I could see that, I would have messed my pants, okay? And then <laughs> even though it happened 13 billion years ago. So, <laughs> you know, can't go just, visit. Oh, we can go, oh, yeah, that just happened a just, long time ago. It doesn't matter. <laughs> just can't go visit. That's all. Uh, it would have you blown know, my mind. Just, it's, it's the idea, it's just the scale of, of what's out there is very difficult for we mere mortals to be able to comprehend. The distances, you know, like for instance, you know, if you're going to fly a 747 to the moon, it'd take 16 days to get there at the speed of, an, of, of, a, of a 747. You know, and that's just, and you thought a, a flight to Hong Kong, Scott, is what? Is what, 16 hours? You know, from here, 16 yeah. Day. yeah, from here, 16 yeah, hours from, here. from from central United States to Hong Kong, 16 yeah. hours. We're talking about 16 days to I get just to the moon. Really like this. This is this is nice. You like that? Yeah. Okay, so Paul, I'm emailing you a link that Harold Locke sent to me, and this is from the uh, Big Think website. So this is a uh, there's a guy named. Um, Ethan, uh, Ethan Siegel, and he is a science popularizer, uh, a PhD uh, physicist, and uh, he is amazing in his explanations, and he writes a blog, he does uh, video programs and stuff like that. I'm going to see if one day I can get, actually get him on one of our programs, but um, yeah, you should show this because it shows the uh, the comparisons that um, Kent was looking for. Working on it. Uh, thank you, Harold, for passing that along to us. You know, the comparison, it's just, it's you just, it's like explaining what the sunspots look like and then looking at the sunspots. The difference is just immense. Or explaining really what an think... eclipse is like and actually seeing one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's just, you can't do it. It's hard. To, it's just hard. Right. But, but I think... You know, we as amateur astronomers need to seize on these moments and and educate yourself a little bit, and and talk about what you understand and and say I don't know. You know, there's mm -hmm. times I say I say I don't know because or that's not anywhere that I've done any reading on because I, I can try and wing it and BS it or and I'm gonna get caught and and, and flub it up and I don't want to be wrong or that wrong anyway. You know, so but uh. You know, it's it's hard to go out and look at the full moon tonight, you know, because it's going to be bright through a telescope. But go out and just my wife is over at a friend's house, and they're having going to turn the the uh, lights in the swimming pool off and lights in the backyard off, and just swim and watch the the moonrise, you know, tonight. And just here we go. 
uh, visually enjoy it. Boom. There you go. Yeah. <clears throat> so what are we looking at here, Paul? You're looking at the website. What is the... Does it say what the uh, images are here? This is the James Webb's first science images before and after from the Big Think website. Uh, now that it's fully commissioned, the James Webb Space Telescope begins its exploration of the universe, and here are its first science images. Uh, so it's not saying, I think the top one is a Hubble, and no. I think the middle and bottom ones are James West. No, the three panel, let me look here, it's, it's really opaque, so I've got to get in there and really... Uh, the th this three panel image shows the views of the Carina Nebula's cosmic cliff seen by, you're right, the Hubble, um, JWST's near cam instrument, and JWST's MIRI instrument. With its okay, first science release yeah. upon us, the new era in astronomy has truly arrived. Sorry. Yes. So look at that dust. <laughs> look at the dust. You know, these are not scaled exactly the same, I don't think. But but look at the dust in the top one, the little clouds. Which when we saw those images, Scott, from the Hubble, yeah. It, yeah. it was jaw dropping. You know, but but as people were teasing, you know you think the Hubble images were jaw dropping? Wait until you see the JWST because it's going to make the Hubble pictures look like just snapshots. And that's that's the case. Absolutely the case. Well, so, and I have that image. Uh, there you go. This is the full, full res image released. Uh, and it's, it's another one of those that I can just zoom forever and the detail stays. How big is this a TIFF or a JPEG? Did you download? I got this? it as a PNG because okay, so uh, TIFFs don't work well on the software. This particular oh, okay. image is forty-seven point eight megs. Uh, it's Too not bad quite you can't as big. Use TIFFs. Yeah. Its dimensions are eleven thousand two hundred sixty-four by three thousand nine hundred and four. That puts it at. 7k 8k so it's pretty pretty big zoom in there paul working on it i mean we're in there tight just incredible incredible detail you know some artifacts in a couple of places well sure. just yeah fantastic um, can you slide it to the left or up or down or something? Go I up. A, I can a second from now. Hang on. Let me put you guys back up on screen. And, um, and Paul, you said this is the Eta Carina. Huh? This is the Eta Carina Nebula, correct? The one that you were, we were just looking at with the comparisons yeah. from Hubble. Yeah. What's this one? Does it say? This is this is uh, with James same, Webb. Same thing. This is the same thing. Yeah, right. Here's a good question from Becca. He says, do you think that Jay West pictures will affect our thoughts on how deep into space we amateur astronomers can go? I mean, will we change our seeing what uh, to image in the future? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes and yes. yes. <laughs> Hubble Space look, Telescope you know, did that. And, and Palomar, the Palomar 200-inch telescope did that. And the 100-inch at Mount Wilson did that. And so... Uh, yeah, every landmark telescope, uh, you know, that becomes the new thing to benchmark against. And um, so, you, and the thing that's that's true, and 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 Pekka, you know this. The the once you show amateurs something that's out there, okay, uh, amateurs will figure out a way to image it. Not not to this detail and resolution. But they'll they'll go back through their old images and they'll go, oh yeah, I did, I now see it, okay, and then they'll drill down on it and take, you know, track and stacking, 
until they get uh, more detail. Uh, but uh, definitely, th those would be things that uh, uh, amateur astronomers will do. I think that uh, like Hubble, uh, I'm sure the Space Telescope Science Institute will release the raw data of these images uh, for amateurs and, and professionals to use. Um, uh, you know, and there will be people that will take uh, the, uh, you know, uh, one of the images in, you know, black and white image with a lot of detail and use that as the luminance uh, layer in some of their shots, um, you know, and then bring in their own color, uh, you know, shots that they might do with their own telescopes. And as long as you're telling people that's what you're doing, okay, uh, then there's, there's no harm, no foul. Um, but the, the moment some amateur claims you know, that uh, they're getting this much detail and they have, uh, you know, nefariously used uh, J West uh, luminance frame, uh, well, you know, we're going to be able to figure that out uh, pretty easily, I think. Certainly, yeah. if you see anything with six bytes in it, uh, that's going to be one of the giveaways for sure. <laughs> but there'll be amateur astronomers that will remove those artifacts and, um, and try to own it. But, uh, uh, you know, most of us are, I would say most amateur astronomers are pretty darn honest, so. Yeah, you know, as Harold Locke just said, just as long as people aren't faking their work, we've all That's seen right. people who, who get, it, who get called it out on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. it happens, yeah. right? And so, you will, so, you'll okay. get found out because amateur astronomers, it doesn't take them a lot to figure out that, oh, wow, okay, this much detail, you have done something, you know, um, so, yeah. So Scott, you know, to answer, I'll answer Pekka's question with an example. You know, when okay. the Hubble Space Telescope came out and they had that picture of the Eagle Nebula, people were just blown away by it, right? Sure. And it wasn't that many years later until people were using, well, J is it Jason Gunzeal with a, with a 152? You know, there's people out there with, 152 millimeter telescopes, 165 millimeter telescopes, mm -hmm. big Newtonians who are taking pictures of the Eagle Nebula that while not as, as amazing as the Hubble didn't, hadn't tried that before, but yet the Hubble inspired them to go out there and try and do it sure. and see what they could come up with and came up with some pictures that are astoundingly close to what the Hubble Space Telescope has done. So I think it's going to drive people to think about working maybe more in the deep, deep, far infrared and trying to figure out ways to modify sensors or enhance what they already do. And to, to get the resolution, uh, you know, certainly you can shoot at longer focal length in the mosaic. Uh, now, these are things that pros don't do so much because they need uh, you know, they need to be productive. They need to be going on to the next thing. They're getting, they're gathering images for science. They're not doing it for, uh, to try to get it on the cover of Sky Telescope Magazine, for example, okay? Right. Um, uh, you know, but uh, amateur astronomers, they own their own equipment. This is the advantage. And you can, you know, you can uh, go for a long focal length, shoot a small section of say like the Andromeda Galaxy, and then move over and another small section and move over and, um, you know, it's not quite the same as having the larger telescope, but you do get incredible resolution and, uh, and unbelievable detail by doing that. Um, but, you know, it can, be, it can be a project that you spend the better part of the year on. So, yeah. I look forward to see what people come up with inspired by this in the next couple of years to try and start adding, you know, some really deep infrared to their... To their um, palettes and, and going back and adding it to stuff they've already shot. Yeah. Um, so. Unfortunately, our atmosphere is uh, the problem with infrared. Um, uh, so, you know, one of the places that you could go as an amateur is Mount Wilson. They have some one of the darkest infrared skies in the world. Really? Right next to uh, Pasadena, which is super light polluted. <laughs> <laughs> why, why is that, Scott? Tell, why, what, what, why is it not got an infrared pollution? Any idea? Because they don't light up cities with infrared light. Yeah. I mean, that's that's uh, one of the simple answers right there. So. Yeah. 
I mean, if they did, it would be really light polluted, but they don't, you know, so, um, but uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, that's the reason why the Chara array is there and uh, it's an all infrared system as well. So, you know, it, it's, look at that. at least we can see into the infrared. Look, look at that. That's, that's little spirals and spirals. It looks like, it looks like there's a cross, but I think it's a couple of colliding galaxies. Yeah. Maybe more than two colliding galaxies, uh -huh. and it just goes on and on. There's a barred spiral out there. There's, but every speck, I mean, even down to what looks like a tiny salt speck, there is a galaxy. Yeah, every single pixel that has some light on it is is, is a, a galaxy. galaxy. Is a galaxy. That's mind blowing. It, it because again, this is this is a fraction of a degree, a tiny fraction of a degree of sky. And I'm doing. A fraction of that yeah and and just spread that out over the entire sky just truly astounding astounding so, so Connor right, wants so, to know what are my thoughts on flat earthers I feel sorry for them that's all <laughs> so, and and you can't argue thought. with them you can't there is no, no it's a belief system them. so you know you're not there's no science involved here with flat earthers right so I, I think if, if I it'd be fun to talk Elon Musk into sending the two top flat earthers, the two preeminent flat earthers, send them to the ISS, let them spend a couple of days there, have them come home and see what the impact would be on their belief system. But, if but they we can't, came back. we can't, Kent, because the ceiling is too low. I understand, Paul. That's why it would be fun to have them to send some up and let them literally go around the earth in a circle. You know, the, the, the fascinating part is the ancient Egyptians knew the earth was round. A guy used a well and, and, a, and a measurement of distance, an angle of light going down two different wells to get within... I, he was within less than 10% of the circumference of the earth, what, 3,000 years ago? Mm -hmm. And Is that a galaxy of galaxies? You mean all those galaxies there in the background? No, uh, in, in the bottom middle. Zoom what out. It's, it's, a, it's, a for, it's a foreground galaxy. Yeah. Probably. probably. These are all different distances and stuff, but... Again, everything that doesn't have spikes on it is a galaxy. Is it a galaxy of galaxies? No, that would be a start. That would be a galaxy. Well, cluster. you're asking me is there, there are a galaxy galaxies, cluster. and yes, uh, this is Stevens Quintet. Uh, some, I think, four of them are three. actually. Uh, is it three? That's there's three. Well, there's three of four. them are gravitationally. Three are right. yeah, and one of them is a foreground galaxy. So. I don't. I, I don't know which ones are which. So yeah. either a foreground or a background. But yeah, um, there's three that are actually gravitationally paired, and then a another one that is either either close or closer or farther away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Wow. And you can see those. I mean, under dark skies, there's lots of people take pictures of them. You can see those under dark skies, with with your naked eye. It's just amazing to sit there and go okay i'm looking at that but then yeah i've seen this square, yeah but draw that draw a square on that and in that view that you can't see because they're so far away are literally hundreds of more galaxies in that tiny field of view up there so yeah all right scott it's five o'clock up oh, here's offered <laughs> i turn into a thought. we're turning into a pumpkin so anyway, if we do live in a fabricated universe. The programmers will have, will have been working hard recently to write software to allow the JWT to show new stuff. Uh, interesting thought there. Yes, uh, that we're all actually just in the matrix. So uh, it's a steady state of galaxies. Rainbow harvest. Uh, we have some new, we have some names I haven't seen before. It's awesome to see new people joining yeah, us thank here. You for watching, uh, we we I, I tell on on my uh, Amazon Live and my social media broadcast at one thirty and two o'clock. 
I literally thank them for giving us their time because they are sharing their time with us and that is a blessing to us. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So uh, Mike Wiesner says, we'll see Quintet at Arizona Dark Sky Star Party. Thanks, Mike. So Mike is the lead on that. If you're interested in the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party, you can go to the Explore Scientific website and uh, search for Arizona Dark Sky Star Party. Uh, it's $150 register for the ticket that's going to get you uh, lectures, access to the park at night, uh, camping in the park. It's going to be tent dry camping in the park. Uh, you won't be able to bring an RV. And then you're going to have to stay there somewhere if you're not camping in the park. Uh, Biosphere 2 from the University of Arizona yeah, has, uh, has housing there for uh, people who come to do research. And we can res a reserve, you can get a, a they're like a, a bedrooms with a central communal area. Uh, $520, which is like $120 a night or something like that. Uh, you know, you're going to pay that for a hotel or bed and breakfast, or there's Airbnbs and bread and bed and breakfast around Oracle as well. Um, get out there. Uh, if you don't bring a scope, don't bring a scope. We're going to have some scopes out there. There will be plenty of people with scopes. And if you're just interested, just bring yourself and bring your curiosity. Uh, September 21 through 25, Oracle State Park, northeast of Tucson. Arizona, pristine dark skies. Yep. Uh, it's going to blow your socks off if you've never seen it before. Worth the effort to come to it. Uh, Pekka says, read about Lenakia, our local supercluster, uh, but there are a couple of more and how they move in the universe. Yep. Absolutely. Scott, any closing thoughts? No, I just look at those, all those galaxies are kind of filling my mind right now. I'm sure just like everybody else that's uh, interested in astronomy and stuff, uh, uh, it's, um, it's made us all jubilant, uh, kind of filled with wonder and, uh, you know, really anticipating what's coming next, you know, because they've just, they just scratched the tip of the iceberg of what they can do with Jay West. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful well, image, and uh, yeah, you can you can just stare at that image all day long. It's it's crazy, but we got work to do. So <laughs> just keep this, burn this into your brain, uh, so that you can uh, shut your eyes and still see it, and um, uh, you know, and keep looking up. Thanks, thanks God. Scott. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Hey folks, Sean here from Visible Dark on YouTube and VisibleDark.ca on the web. Just want to send a big congratulations to Scott and Explore Scientific on the 100th episode of the Global Star Party. Fantastic stuff. Keep up the great work. Here's to 100 more. Howdy, Scott, Explorer Alliance, Astronomical League, and esteemed Global Star Party friends. This is Cameron from Camp Astronomy, wishing you all a hearty congratulations on our 100th Global Star Party. Keep looking up and enjoy the journey. Cheers.
Gentlemen. Hello, everyone. It's Bob Fugate from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Congratulations to the Global Star Party on achieving 100 exciting episodes. Please keep up the great work. Thank you.